outcome is a very simple outcome, which is that uh, long-term rates over which, gov uh, over which central banks have limited control will soar. Ten-year treasuries will yield between 10 and 13%. And what does that do to a world that is indebted to the extent of three and a half times global GDP? Do they just run it hot and try and uh, deflate? No, that no. You, have, <laughs> you, have a, you have a big collapse. They've run hot and that hasn't worked. No, we just have major collapse. On this episode of the What the Finance Podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming on Simon Hunt. So, Simon, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. My pleasure. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So there's been a lot of talk recently about, I guess, the Fed and, and other central banks. Maybe they've done the impossible and they've actually landed the plane. They've saved the economy. It's not going into a recession. Um you know, maybe in the US and globally as well. So I guess from your opinion, did you agree with this or do you think that there's potentially further pain to come? I think it's uh, inevitable that the US is going into recession. In fact, it's probably already in recession. Uh, people look at the employment data without realizing, excuse me, the vast revisions that have taken place in the employment data. And uh, if you look at the hours worked also, they're falling. Um, you're beginning to see cracks in the employment situation. There's a report out the other day showing that uh, job openings dropped to a two-year low as number of hires and quits plunge. So it's going to take a catalyst for the market to to appreciate reality, <clears throat> but it's coming. Whether it's coming from um, problems in the US Treasury markets, uh, or whether it's coming from an external event, which could be any number of developments. Uh, for instance, um, Putin, rather like a heavyweight boxer, has absorbed a large number of punches and he's probably going to uh, lash out somewhere at some time. Uh, how, we don't know, but forget about uh, nuclear war. That's, that's just um, nonsense doesn't need nuclear war, he's got hypersonic missiles. Or you can see um, issues in the Straits of Hormos, propelled by America, trying to show that it's still got lots of weight and power to, to influence developments. Um, or, <clears throat> and I think this is this is a real wild card. There are all sorts of reports emanating out of the U.S. Transport Securitization Association that a new lockdown in America is arriving. Um, it'll start with <clears throat> masks being compulsory for. Uh, key people like medicals, um, aircraft personnel, and whether it slowly moves into a complete lockdown or rapidly in, into a complete lockdown, I'm not yet sure. I'm just waiting for more information. So all I'm saying is that um, there will be some catalysts which will wake the market up out of its complacency. And when the markets start falling, which they will 
uh, continue to decline. We've got a fall in the S&P of about 30% by the end of the year, stroke early next year. And once that happens, then the complacency of companies will flitter away. Um, hours worked, falling hours worked will, re will be replaced by falling employment. And of course, that then is a knock-on impact. Add to all of that, um, lenders, whether banks or shadow banking, are tightening their standards. Um, even a large number, so I'm told, of claimants for unemployed compensation. Uh, apparently, the latest take is that 32% were denied because they were false, false claims. So you're going to see a uh, combination of manufacturing activity remaining weak. The U.S. Conference Board's uh, leading indicator in July was down for the 16th month in, in succession. Add that to tightening lending standards, and we will see America in recession by the end of this year. Um, I don't think it will be a deep recession. That comes later. Because the Fed and other G7 central banks will be forced to revert back to QE and to drop interest rates, as the markets will also, by the autumn, will start having to reassign the probability of war over Ukraine, that it's not going to be a benign outcome. So troubled period ahead. Um, the hangover will be relieved by central banks going full blast on opening credit taps, inflation is going to reappear. It's falling at the moment. That was all part of our forecasts. But it remains sticky because if you look at between 2014 and 2021, that seven-year period, central banks and governments unleashed $200 trillion more than the value of GDP. Once inflation starts to tick up again, a lot of that, that, that money will have to find a home. So we will get the second wave of inflation, and second waves are always much more severe than the first waves. And we have global inflation next year, by the end of next year, running at between 13 and 15% global, exasperated by energy prices rising sharply because of supply disruptions, food prices soaring for weather and supply disruptions, Weather, because we will see either by the end of next year or early in 2025, the onset of the 89-year Glesberg cycle, which last created the mid Midwest Dust Bowl decade. So that's taking the world up to the end of next year. Uh, so by the end of the next year, you said there's a uh, potential to be really high inflation and uh, other factors that are yeah. 
they're really going to yeah impact so what, the, uh, what what then is the outcome the outcome is a very simple outcome which is that uh, long term rates over which gov uh, over which central banks have limited control will soar 10 year treasuries will yield between 10 and 13% and what does that do to a world that is indebted to the extent of three and a half times global GDP. Do they just run it hot and try and uh, deflate? No, that no. You, have, <laughs> you, have a, you have a big collapse. They've run hot and that hasn't worked. No, we just have major collapse. Yeah, it's scary to think. So as you're saying the major collapse is that from a societal or is that just uh from a financial system or or is it it's sort of everything combined <clears throat> it's everything combined <clears throat> excuse me uh many countries are already in civil unrest that will get even worse when economic and financial conditions deteriorate, you could even say that in some countries you'll have civil war. And the probability is that, well, that's too strong a word. The possibility is that you will have a war between countries in the G7 against countries in the BRICS, i.e. the war between NATO and Russia will expand. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. If we go to China, and that's, uh, you know, we, we've talked more globally, but if we sort of go specifically to China, it seems like there's already, they're struggling quite a lot as well. So do you see that as another country that's going to struggle in the short term and during this period? No, I... I think, exotically, that China is actually using capitalist policies by allowing the weak companies and weak sectors to collapse. Um, that is a clear policy that emerges after the seaside retreat earlier this month. They will allow developers and others to fail, but they will support homeowners. They won't allow local governments to fail. But in return, they will take greater control over local government budgets. So that comes back to the age-old rivalry that has existed for centuries between the center and local governments. And ever since infrastructure uh, was developed in China, the fiefdoms, the local government fiefdoms, had collapsed. And now you're going to see the end game where the center takes control. We don't see that in sort of the 60s and 70s with Mao and that led to disaster. I think I think it's 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 positive. It's a cleaning up of the system. I think probably what you are seeing now, um, Western companies are, are leaving China. Chinese are buying. So I think in terms of stock market, China's probably not got more than another 10% to fall, whereas we've got globally falls by the end of the year to early next year of 30 to 40%. Makes sense. So we've talked about the US and China specifically. Do you see Europe being the worst affected during this period? 
Uh, I think, well, where do we start? Um, there's little doubt that Europe's recession will deepen in the second half of this year. You can see it in the order books of some basic industries, falls of between 20 to 40 percent year on year. I think the bigger issue long term is the survivability of the EU. I think that's in serious doubt. You've got the Bundesbank openly saying, We've got our own problems. We're no longer going to be able to finance you guys. Um, politically, governments have to have to make the decision. We can't sit on the fence between the East and America forever. We've got to make a, We've got to make a stance. Industry particularly in Germany, knows where their future lies, which is eastwards. But the politicians say no. Interestingly, according to a recent study that was done by Kiev Uni University, only 10% of German companies have actually exited Russia. The big game, big names have left but the small, the smaller brethren remain. And you have the same in China. Um, the big chemical company is investing 10 billion. German industry is probably not going to leave China despite what their political masters persuade them to do. Um, so I think <clears throat> Europe really sits in the firing line between the East and the West. I think what it implies is probability you're going to see massive political change within Europe. Yeah, and we are seeing uh, extremism taking over multiple countries, either left or right. It seems to be where politics are going throughout Europe. Um, I have heard you talk as well about this combination of Germany, China, and Russia, and how the US fears such a maybe not an alliance, but you know, trade, 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 and uh, oh. collaboration. Is that something that you think could be a yeah, issue well moving forward? Basically, um, two strands come out of that question of yours. The first one is that America, ever since 1991, if not post-World War II, their overriding policy has been to dismember Russia so that they can, can take control of Russia's huge natural resources. More recently, the growing alliance that did exist between Germany, uh, Russia, and China was a risk that Washington could not allow to develop. Because if you go back to Halford McKinder in 1904, he who controls the heartland controls the world. And that's what Bruninsky and his, his uh, recent followers um, did not want to see happen and why they have broken that alliance. Nord Stream 2 is the classic, classic example. So that just adds to the political turmoil, um, which one can see evolving in Europe. 
I agree. So if we look at what you've said so far, you talk about minor recession in the next six months or so, followed by a more severe recession sort of at the end of 2024, start of 2025. Yeah, so- but interrupted by uh, a huge inflation-driven recovery. The last hurrah one might describe it as. So lots of euphoria, lots of positive thoughts that yeah, everything's been avoided. You know, uh, you can see what's going to happen in manufacturing. For for example, instead of destocking, they restock, and they add even more to uh, hedge against a falling dollar, against rising commodity prices, and inflation. And households will be doing the same. The investment community will do the same. So you'll see oil well over 150 and base metals at least double current prices. And then what would uh, happen to the markets in 2024? I'm guessing you mentioned sort of equities would crash. equities, Equities will soar. After falling sharply by the end of the year, S&P will probably double. But you have to be careful not to be the last guy on the dance floor when the music stops. Yeah, makes sense. So you mentioned there that, um, you know, this, this will be quite a turbulent period. So what what happens afterwards? So after this, you've mentioned sort of there could be civil wars, there could be uh, you know lots of in- instability around the world. Then I guess what what comes out of that period? I think probably one of the most fraught in modern history: um, economically, the world will either be in deep recession or depression. Politically, you will have internal strife within countries and externally between countries, social instability. I think it's a period that's going to last until the early 2030s. And then common sense starts prevailing the Davos crowd led by Klaus Schmidt will be deposed. Their influence will be stamped out. Common sense will prevail. Wokeness will disappear. Rule of law will become the foundations of the new society. So it's going to be an extremely difficult period, but you come out of it, and that's when the world reverts to its growth rates, trend growth rates that has has existed since 1900 of 4% a year. And that's when the metals industry goes into its golden age. Until then, it's just a trader's market. So would you compare maybe this next decade to what happened in the 1930s or during the Great Depression? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, it's not a down year every year. But the up years are selling opportunities. Makes sense. So you you talked about how there could be this basically a commodity, you know, uh, super cycle uh, for base metals, and and would this be for precious metals as well? And this is this mainly just because of the inflation and I guess the depreciation of fiat currencies, or is this just because of this? There's going to be shortages. Why would that occur? Well, <clears throat> um, 
until, <coughs> excuse me, until the early 2030s, it's going to be base metals, prices are going to collapse, the demand won't be there, uh, the financing will be difficult, companies will go into bankruptcy. But it's when you get into the early 2030s, where inflation is, um, is worked out, growth rates, as I said before, go back to the trend growth rates that have existed since 1900. And that's when the commodity markets and base metals um, have their golden age. The question then is in what currency will metal producers sell their production for? Um, it's quite interesting if you go back to 1980, copper prices have risen by four and a half times and costs by three and a half times. But in grams of gold, prices have risen by only 48% and costs by 13%. So you can say that producers, what have they received in return for their output? Dollars that since 1980 are today worth only 25 cents. It's illusionary profits. And I think that by 2030, the BRICS world will cover many of the countries producing the principal base metals like copper. And they won't be selling their output for dollars. So you turn John Connolly's famous Treasury Secretary's quip on its head when he said, the dollar is our currency, but your problem BRICS will actually say, commodities are our assets, but your problem. So then that would be um, a commodity-backed currency. Do you see it being no, precious? I think, no, I don't. I think it's. I think producing a commodity-backed currency gets too too complex. I think it will end up by being a gold-backed currency not necessarily convertible, may be convertible within the BRICS community, but not externally. Okay, but thanks. we'll okay. probably know a bit more about that at the end of the BRICS meeting, where I think the focus is going to be more on de-dollarization. That is developing more payment mechanisms between countries that exclude the dollar. And I think it's going to take some years before they can actually fix a single currency. Do you think de-dollarization is possible with rising dollar price, the depreciating uh, Chinese yuan, is it possible to for these economies to de-dollarize? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, we've already seen it start. Um, UAE, um, India, for instance, big trade deal excluded the dollar. Uh, you've got countries selling oil not for dollars. You have uh, the IMF agreeing with Argentina to accept remimbi or repayment of interest and debt. What does that mean? It means that effectively the IMF has accepted remimbi as a currency. So 
other countries don't have to uh, build up reserves of dollars. Instead, they just have to sell more commodities and other goods to China. So if we look at the US, the reason the US dollar is uh, obviously so international is because of its deficit and exporting consumption. Is that something that China is able to do? Uh, China's trade policy is pretty clear. Uh, trade with Europe and America is falling sharply. Trade with BRICS and BRI countries is rising sharply. That trend will continue. Um, I think the statement that she made to Gulf countries at the end of last year was very informative. Effectively, he said, you will have surpluses with us for some years, and we will have surpluses with you in some years. How we, res how we resolve those surpluses will be through a third party. I think he said uh, through an interstate mechanism is the word he used. Okay, so if we look at this sort of period, it seems like our whole economic system is going to change. Um, how, you know, can our current economy survive with a gold-backed currency or does it have to shift away from the debt burdens growth that we've seen over the past few decades? Well, I think G7 countries will continue to operate on a fiat currency basis. But most of the rest of the world ain't going down that road. I, that's why I think sometime in the mid-2020s, the risk of war spreading more globally than just confined to Ukraine and neighboring countries is a real risk because it's the end of the American empire. Can't imagine them going out without a fight. Yeah. So, so if we look at assets, it sounds like there's not really any one asset that would um, help to protect wealth during this period. Is there, or as you said, is it going to be more of a trader's market in the coming years? Well, I think the I think precious metals, gold. I think there's no question about that. That's how you will be able to retain your the value of your assets. But I think in terms of stock markets and other commodities, um, after the big rise in 2024 next year, it's going to take a long time for them to, to return to current pricing yeah so simon thanks so much for your time today i really appreciate it um my, my last question is what is one message you'd like people to take away from our conversation be cautious and if you want to follow what we're saying our website is simon-hunt.com. Perfect. Is there anywhere else people can find your work or is that the best place for it? That's the best place. Okay, great. Or else, or else to email us on simon at shss.com. Perfect. I'll put that in the description, but Simon, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Good to chat to you. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.